Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So did you ever have that feeling you, you got things done, really? They did work, but they're both ugly and painful. You went through a lot of pain to code this thing. And there must have been a better way somehow. My name is Pier Giorgio Calzi, PG for short. I have been working in data for four and a half years, roughly. And one of the latest projects I worked on is uh, building a tool that sample delivers and analyze brand surveys. Now, the company I work for is Activision Blizzard Media, which is a part of King. So as you might know, Activision Blizzard acquired King a while back, and Activision Blizzard Media represents the advertising division of this union. Within that scope, uh, uh, the tool delivers brand surveys, which means that an advertising campaign runs on, on our platform. And we want to answer a question of the kind, how well do people remember the brand after seeing the ad? So this is just a little bit about me and what I did recently. Now, my day-to-day -day life is a little bit like a roller coaster. What do I mean by that? I mean that there are some loop-the-loops, you know, when you go all around. And it's kind of fun. It's like software engineering, machine learning. It sometimes happens. It's fun. And you know, uh, then you have like a bunch of other things, like uh, the smaller sense, like in which you create presentation and build business cases for projects you want to work on. But realistically, a good chunk of my time is in this flat zone in which I just like uh, go through a lot of meetings and work on a lot of pandas. Now, pandas, as you might know, is a library for data manipulation for Python. So what I want to share with you today is a, a bunch of nice functions and maybe less known things that I keep looking up every time. And every time I go, ah, if I only remember these, I wouldn't have gone for like a billion stack overflows. <laughs> <laughs> so the aim of this presentation is to make this ride just as smooth as you would write your SQL in, like nice and pleasant. Now, I am going to soon move to a Jupyter Notebook. Since it's, again, also for myself, uh, the first presentation I deliver in such a big context, I decided to go for live coding, because what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I have 10 tips over there that I cover, because I got a little bit excited about all the things that I found out. Today, I'm going to share with you only five. Now, without further ado, and the second of swapping. OK, so a little bit of housekeeping here. I'm just importing three libraries, Pandas, which is fairly obvious, OS to import files from a directory, and matplotlib to perform some basic plotting. Now, first of all, acknowledgments. Uh, I took uh, an openly available data set. It's the weather data from Kago. So everyone eventually will share this notebook with you if you're interested, and you can just reproduce the whole thing. Before starting, uh, this is weather data, so it's mostly time series, really. Uh, Probably techniques that are appropriate are within the domain of signal processing or time series analysis. However, the point uh, that I make here is that I chose this data set because it's fairly flexible to show a bunch of techniques uh, that are available in Pandas. I'm not claiming that these are the optimal techniques to use for this data. So what happens here, I'm just reading all the files in the current directory, and uh, I am generating a dictionary containing uh, the name of the CSV file and uh, the data frame imported through pandas.readcsv. Uh, now, the first data we look at is uh, weather description data. So you will see this recurring throughout many data frames that I use. The first column is date time, is an hour granularity level time variable, which currently is in its string status, so it's not recognized as an object. The other variables are, of course, uh, a bunch of cities in the US. There are some cities in Israel. And uh, in each cell, you can see a description of what the weather was like on that time. Now, I said the date timer is not in the perfect shape. So the first thing we do is simply bringing it in as a date time object with a pandas.todatetime. I'm now giving you a glimpse uh, of what the data same status is. Uh, it's mostly filled. There are a bunch of missing values. Ah, interesting. Sure. There we go. Better. Now, 
here's the problem. I really wanted to share with you tip one. However, tip one went on strike because it was really unhappy about not being zero indexed. So I need to start with tip two, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, okay, this is the first tip I really want to share. So often when we get a data set, uh, we have a bunch of variables and what we want to see is like some feel for the data, just to understand how it works. Now, the first thing we would like to do is uh, tackle each variable independently without looking at the correlation. So in Pandas, it's really straightforward to produce distributions uh, for continuous variables. It's a little bit trickier to do it for categorical variables. Now, this is an example of what this process would look like. We are grouping by the variable New York, and then each group performs uh, an aggregate function, which is size, so how many rows uh, contain non-null values. We then divide it by the count uh, of uh, the New York variable again as a whole, so what proportion of the total. And we finally sort the value in the sending order, pick the first five, and then plot it. This is what you get out. Now, was there a better way? So, here we could go with uh, w underscore desk, uh, which is our data frame, and then we would select uh, the New York variable, which comes out as a series. We use the method from series, which is values counts, if I'm not mistaken, and we look at what we get. Great. So this is the absolute frequency of that series. Now, what we would like uh, is a relative frequency. Well, easily enough, uh, there is a flag called normalize. We will set to true. And now this comes out uh, as a relative. Now it's very easy from here. We just plot dot bar. That's exactly the same one as before. However, we forgot to just filter the first five. And there we go. Same chart here than we had here, just in a nicer way. Now, the next tip I want to show you is tip number four. It's about sampling. Now, when we get this data, often we want to sample it somehow for multiple purposes. Bootstrapping might be one. One that is one of my favorites is just like a, um, stratified, uh, ex post stratified sampling, which is fairly nice. Now, I will show you what I mean in a second. First, we need to reshape the data a little bit. We go away from New York and we look at Portland now. So all I did here, and I'm going to kind of like uh, flash through this, is uh, I took my date time variable and I transform it uh, at the level of granularity, which is uh, day. Now, the interesting part uh, happens in a second. I do another little transformation, which gives me another variable, which is uh, at the level of granularity of month and day, which is what I want to perform my sampling upon. Now, first, let's look at the normal random sampling. Really boring, really old, but always give sample five. So these would give us a random sample of five elements out of the whole data frame. And as you can see from date time, they're just randomly selected. Now, it gets a little bit more interesting when you put this together with group by. So w underscore desk, which is our data frame, port aggregate, we group it by our um, month and day variable. And we have a flag, which is a group keys equal false. Now, we have this group by element, this group by object, and we decide to perform an apply function, which wouldn't work if the flag group keys wasn't there in this way. This takes a lambda function, which takes as an input each column as a series. This is x. Perform x dot sample. So we sample each series within this group object. And how do we do it? We want the minimum size between the series itself, sorry, the length of the series, and three. So for each slice of the data, give me three. Oh, sorry, apologies. Yes, you're right. There we go. So going quickly through it again, we group it by, we apply the function in which each series is sampled for what size of sample? Well, we want three elements from each one of these slices, but if we don't get it, we're happy with whatever length we have in there. 
And now you can see that, for instance, the first three elements are from month and day one one, and we just got this neat way of like getting stratified sampling in which we access each window independently. Now, of course, you can play with it rather than using length of x or three as a fixed value. You can change it and make it whatever proportion you like. So this was tip number two. I'm going to move to tip number three. But first, I want to introduce a new data set. This is about the direction of the wind. Same structure as before, all the cities. Values in the, cell, the cells are between 0 and 360, which are the degrees which position indicate where the wind is coming from. <coughs> now, same transformation as before for the date. So what we do here? We sometimes want to take a continuous variable and transform it into a categorical variable. There are a bunch of reasons for that. Maybe our model doesn't cope very well with continuous data. Maybe we just want to visualize it better in a human interpretable form. But here's what we do. We create 12 buckets. Each one of these letters corresponds to like a cardinal position. For instance, this one is a, sorry, let me throw it up. Can you see it? Yeah, cool. So the first one, for instance, is north northeast. Now, we can actually apply a nice function called pd.cat. So what cat will do, will take uh, a series, uh, which in this case is uh, w underscore dear. And uh, we want uh, to take, uh, let's say, San Francisco this time. We then want to assign a new variable to this data frame. Uh, wait, give me a second. No. That's another place. OK, better. Yes. We want to pass this first parameter, which is just a series. The second parameter is going to be the number of bins that we want to fragment this continuous variable by, in this case, 12. And finally, we want to pass some labels in, which is the 12 uh, wins there. Perfect. What do we get out of it? Interestingly, nothing. I get that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> OK, there we go. I, so what happened here is that when you, have a, when you have a data frame like this, and you use only one square bracket, you're going to get a series out of it. But when you use a double square bracket, uh, sometimes it's what you want to do in order to get a data frame out of it. It's a quite a nice, nice and neat trick. OK. Uh, there we go. So this now works. And as we wanted, we get exactly that mapping in which uh, each one of the things uh, maps to southeast, uh, is southeast, and so forth. Now we need to bring it back to the original data frame. So sun, fran, wind. It's equal to um, w underscore d. And now we want to use the other way. So this is San uh, Francisco. And then we want to assign something to it, which is, sorry about that, which is this. Assign text one position argument. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, this is going to be called wind underscore direction. I forgot to name the new series. And now we can actually look at it quickly. Sun. Francisco wind, and we can see the new uh, series was added to the original data frame. Now, we can visualize this nicely, producing the chart uh, that you were just looking at. Now, it is not the prettiest and probably the chart I would choose for some production kind of work, but it's good enough for exploratory data analysis to give us a sense that in San Francisco, the wind comes from the sea, as you can see from west, southwest, and west, west northwest being the most uh, frequent categories here. So that was for tip number three. 
I'm gonna move on and skip a bunch of things that you can review at your own leisure. But now we look at temperature data. Again, same as before, nothing different. Uh, we have uh, daytime and we have all the cities, but the temperature looks a little bit weird. It's too high for us. We wouldn't live very well there. We discovered that is, of course, uh, in uh, Kelvin. And what is completely missing here is a way to access all of those cells at the same time. Because we don't really want to scan each one of the columns. It's not really the purpose here. It's just to go through all of them at once. So there is a neat trick, which is called apply map. In this case, we look at temperature data, which is equal to, uh, which is equal to temperature. And we then, let me do this up. We go assign. Um, date time, it's equal to pd dot uh, to date time of temp dot date time. So this will, as usual, give our index, get our index in a nice position. We now set index equal to date time. And uh, what do we do? We perform an apply map. In which we say, OK, apply this function. Sorry, could you scroll up? Or? Yes, sorry, I keep forgetting. You're right to call me out on this. And um, so um, we apply this function, lambda, in which uh, each single value is going to be equal to x minus, uh, and I'm totally copying this, 273.15, which is the conversion that we need to apply to get Celsius out of Kelvin. Time to date time. Oh, temp dot temp. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, yes. You're right. Thank you. Brilliant. And now we can look at the data and see that everything has been converted into Celsius degrees. Now, this was tip four. The final one I have for you is about normalizing a variable when we group it by something. So in here we have, uh, again, temperature. And uh, we look at Phoenix this time. All I'm doing in terms of manipulation is just generating a year variable. And what happens next is that we define a Phoenix temperature, which is equal to Phoenix temperature dot group by, let's do it this way that is a little bit clearer. What do we group by? We group by year. Yep. <laughs> it's all right. OK, let me also do this. There. So we have finally this group by year. And uh, what do we do? We perform uh, an operation which is called transform. Now, this is incredibly neat because it allows you to pick uh, a slice of your data, perform an aggregate function over it, and then reuse it on a row by row level within the same slice of data. Why would that be useful? So what we're doing is lambda of x. So for each series, we say that the value of the series is uh, the series itself uh, minus the series uh, dot mean. So we're subtracting the mean from it. Now that we have that value, yes, all we do is divide it by x dot std, which is the standard deviation. One to few. There we go. Now we have this data. We can look at how it looks like. And as you can see, it's normalized. Let me scroll. OK. And now we can visualize it. Mm -mm. 
of course. Group by date time. Yes. No. Let me check a second. Probably I simply lost a variable here. Let me inspect for. Okay, there is no variable that we can access here. So we had phoenix.temp over here. What we can do, however, is just uh, say phoenix temp dot assign. We assign all of these things to a new variable called uh, um, norm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. And now we have fo.temp. We have the normalizing here. <coughs> and now this should run. Nope. Uh, because it's not called norm.underscore temp, it's called norm. And there it is, finally. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So this is my fifth and last tip. I'm going to just conclude by going back to the presentation quickly. So today we saw a bunch of useful functions. These are the first one is a value counts for relative frequencies. The second one is the sample function for any sort of sampling you might like. Then there is a pandas.cat for converting continuous to categorical variables. Uh, then we have apply map here, picks all the cells and apply a function throughout all of them. And finally, transform, which allows you to work within a window using aggregate function and then broadcasting them back uh, on a row by row level. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time.